Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Monday, February 8th, our class session in elementary statistics. And I have some new and exciting experiments to try today. Let me just meet some people in the room here. I'm already recording and I just admitted someone else to the room, so welcome. And uh, doesn't hurt to say again, Monday, February 8th class session, Math 208. We just are getting started 30 seconds ago. And I wanna make sure I have my recording on, yes. I wanna make sure I have my paper pinned, yes. It's amazing how complicated we can make things. But as a reward for how complicated we're making things, we're gonna do a very fun, and visual thing today. So our topic this week is discrete random variables and basically probability distributions. This is what we're gonna talk about today and then a few more things on Wednesday. The overarching topic is probability distribution. So now we're gonna be able to bring together all the things we're doing in some exciting new ways. And I mentioned this in our weekly email to you. I'm going to scan our website briefly and then we'll get started. But discrete random variables, probability distribution function. Yeah, that's kind of funny that they use the PDF for probability distribution function. And nowadays, when someone says PDF, you think of portable document format, which is if, if you know the Geico commercials where the person is trying to coach people not to be their parents. <laughs> they said, okay, now we're gonna open a portable document format and all the students trying to not be like their parents are, oh no, not me, I don't wanna do that. So in common, Everyday language, PDF has come to stand for portable document format, you know, a format for trading documents easily on the web, printing documents easily. But before it was known that way, it was known as the probability distribution function in mathematics. We'll interpret what mean and standard deviation mean in this context. And we'll do a fun experiment in Excel and then I'll post that Excel spreadsheet to our website so you can experiment with it yourself. And then I'll also show you how to graph and interpret this on a calculator. So fun to graph things in Excel, fun to graph things on the calculator. The calculator has that advantage that it's kind of always with you, almost. And it doesn't have to be connected to the internet. You can use Excel on your computer excuse me, you can use Excel on a phone, you can use Excel on a tablet, but yeah, if you want full access to all the Excel features, it's good to use it on a computer. And so you're not always lugging your computer around with you, but you can just throw your calculator in your backpack or your pocket pretty easily. Don't have to charge the battery. <laughs> Although this calculator that we're using right here or one of the ones I'm using, does have battery, uh, has chargeable battery, does not have, you know, AAA batteries. So uh, everything's becoming charging. So when we do this on a calculator, we're gonna show you how to construct a really useful histogram. And then we don't want you to forget about the frequency polygon and some of the ways that we've been talking so far, the frequency polygon was like a little brother who was being ignored, you know, like, oh, this is cute, but this is not that important. Actually, frequency polygons are kind of useful and we'll see why in a way later, but I just don't want you to forget how to make a frequency polygon. So we'll practice that again today. I'm reading your papers and I'll return them to you 
uh, later tonight, tomorrow night, probably. And I want to praise you for one thing, and that is I've been writing on your papers, you know, do this like in the book, do this exactly as in the book, look at the textbook. And you are starting to write things very nicely, just like the book does. I like the way the book does things. So it's not cheating to imitate the book because that's what you're supposed to be learning how to do. So I like some of the graphs that you've produced recently. So I want to just keep emphasizing them because after you get used to them, these graphs will be like so natural, but actually so powerful. Okay, so that's the plan for today. It's going to be fun. And I'm going to just take you to our website for a second just to focus on what we're doing this week. And let me share screen with you and figure out how to do that. Got it, good. And now that's in front of you. And I could make it a little bit easier by expanding the words. Okay, that's a little bit easier. So this is week five in statistics. And I just want to keep the whole calendar of the course in front of you all the time. So uh, this is what we're working on this week. Probability distributions, discrete random variables, binomial distribution, continuous probability functions. This all sounds fancy, but it's going to be, I can explain it so it seems just all normal to you. Let's look inside week five, because what I want you to also look ahead is, is to week six, when we're going to take our first exam. Let me get that all on the screen at once. We've done a lot of things so far. And now we're going to take our first exam over this material. So I'm going to describe it to you now, and I'm going to describe it to you later as well. But the idea is our first exam is going to be covering this material. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how many problems it has on it yet, but I will tell you. Uh, tomorrow and Monday as we get closer. In my mind, it's five and six problems, something like that, four, five, six problems. But they're going to be very much like your homework, which is, yes, they have multiple parts to them. So sometimes it's not fair to say there's only five problems, but there's four parts each. So I want you to think about it like this. Your homework, I've been doing like two problems a week. So I think your exam is going to look like this, you know, four, five, six problems, a little more than your homework. And you're going to have one week to do it. And it's just going to be like a larger homework assignment. Now, doing two problems a week, I don't know whether you consider that heavy or light. I'll just be direct with you. I consider it relatively light. I don't think it takes a long time to do those problems. And as you get better, it takes less time. So I know you could be saying right now, oh my goodness, that takes me a long time. But it will take you less time as you go along. And so on this exam, I'm going to give you six problems, five problems, sure. But they are problems that you've seen before. You know, they're problems from these sections. So that means, yes, I do kind of expect you could do them better now because you've been practicing these problems. So when I say five, six problems, I don't want that to sound overwhelming. They're gonna be like the homework problems. And I think you can do them nicely, but it might take more time than you've put into the regular homework problems. That's like a thumbnail description of your exam. And I will give you a better description if you like on Wednesday. Or remember, you can always just pop in with a question or type it into the chat question. So uh, I just want you to think of your test as like an ordinary, somewhat larger homework problem set. Okay, let's go into week five. I'm getting out of there, excuse me. It's always trying to manage windows on my desktop here. Okay, so. These are the topics we're talking about this week. Ah, okay, I, I see 
myself, I did not write down the problems in the book that you could look at, but I'll write that down later. Excuse me, I left that out. You can just do the problems in the back of the book of chapter four as we go along. We're not doing every section in chapter four. We're just doing the first three, and then we're going to pop into chapter five. So I'll add problems that you could do there. Uh, here's what I said about assessments. So your exam is going to cover those first five chapters, only the problems, only the sections that we've done. You're working on a homework that's due tomorrow night, and then I'll post another homework. But while you're working on the exam, I won't have you doing a homework. I'll just have you working only on the exam. Okay, here's our ordinary stuff, like our office hour notes or class notes. I'll add space for that later today when I scan and post these class notes. I hope you find that useful. And then add, up the, add in the videos here for our session. I want you to pay attention to this uh, thing under technology where I put an Excel spreadsheet called binomial distribution. This is an Excel spreadsheet that we're gonna use next time where I do a nice little experiment that you can play with yourself too. So if you like, you can download this simply by clicking on it. It'll take you to a Google Drive and let me uh, make a list here. Now the Google Drive here, it gives little thumbnails of the stuff that you could download. Maybe sometimes it's easier for me to make a list. See, here's some spreadsheets that you could download. And I'll add to this with one that we're going to make today in class. But you can just download this by clicking on it. Excuse me. Oh, OK. Do you? It's interesting. And I'm using a, a browser here. But every browser nowadays tries to open a spreadsheet inside the browser window. Don't do that because then you got less functionality. This browser that I'm using right now is Microsoft Edge, which I think is decent. I also use Safari frequently. I use Google Chrome less. I do not like some of the things that Google Chrome does from a security point of view. But that's a different topic you could ask me later. But do not uh, manipulate the spreadsheet in the browser window. Just click this little download button and download it to your computer. And then you could open it up with the Excel program on your computer. I, you might know, uh, if you need some help with this, I'll help you, that as a student at Delta College, you have free access to Microsoft Office products. So uh, if you didn't know that or if you didn't use that, just let me know and I could direct you to how you could do that just because you have a Delta College username and login. Okay, so later today, look under this technology section, I'll add another spreadsheet demonstrating what we did today. Okay, that's what I wanted to show you on the spreadsheet. So I'm gonna stop sharing screen. I'm gonna go back. Uh, and I also wanna do one more thing before we get rolling. And that is, I wanna do a little experiment today with my video where I'm actually using this whiteboard. Now you have seen in the meetings, if you're watching this, the whiteboard is a meeting participant all semester in a way, but I don't always refer to it and use it. And that's because you know I'm not always comfortable with every technology. So here, let me put this whiteboard on the screen right now. By on the screen, I mean, I am recording it right now. You can focus on the paper or the whiteboard or my funny blue icon. You, if you're attending the Zoom media meeting live, can focus on anything you want to focus on. But I would like to practice recording on this whiteboard today. So I've written part of the example we're going to do. And then 
Uh, I want to make sure that this records nicely, not because I want to stand in front of the camera because maybe I'm a little bit camera phobic, but sometimes it just might be easier to write things on a board. So, and I'm not going to do this a great deal, but when I do this, I can stand in front of the board, I can look at the camera, and now I'm looking at you in the eye. But if I turn around and write on the board, I'm not looking at you in the eye anymore. And I also want to show you this, that I've tried to set it up so that I could look at anything you show me on uh, just an old television monitor. And I don't know, it's just an experiment and it may not be useful, but let's try it. I, I'm very sensitive to the fact that when I'm talking to you and I'm pointing to the television monitor and you see an infinite collection of David's pointing at the television monitor, I'm very sensitive to the fact that I'm not looking you in the eye and that is not excellent for communication. I understand that, but if I turn to look at you in the eye, this is very wonderful and personal, but then I don't see what you might be showing me on a paper or a screen. And that's what I want to experiment with sometime. I'd like people to also share more paper and screen with me. I know there are a lot of built-in features to Zoom that allow me to do that, but sometimes they're less than real time or they're less than best. And I'd like to try to make things more personal if I can. So when I'm looking at you, that's wonderful. All I see is a camera lens. I don't see your face. When I'm looking at the TV, I could see possibly up here your face or your paper, but then I'm not looking at you. So let's just consider this to be emerging technology. Don't be upset or put off if I'm not looking at you, okay? It's just an experiment. And uh, if you're watching this on a recording, well then, yeah, you get to see all the things that we're doing on the whiteboard. You don't get some real time interaction, but I respect the fact that some of you can't come to this recording at this time. Uh, I'm also wearing a sweater because I'm in my basement and it's relatively cold. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to walk away from that board and go back to my paper and let's roll. So thing that I don't know yet, and I'll have to, that's why I'm calling this an experiment, is I got to make sure that everything is recorded exactly as I want it recorded. So if I make a mistake, and record my funny blue icon for 30 minutes, that's gonna be disappointing. But there's only one way to learn. And that's just to do it. Okay. As usual, you can throw any questions out that you have here, but I think you'll enjoy this experiment today. So let me tell you what a discrete random variable is and then let's do it and actually build the stuff. And I think it's like this a lot in mathematics, that people use a fancy word, and then if you don't do this all the time, maybe you're intimidated or put off by the fancy word. I don't want you to be intimidated or put off by the fancy word. I just want you to learn what the word means, and then you know, you're using it just like everybody else uh, you know, it's like watching the Super Bowl and someone says, oh, the PTA is good. Although nobody ever speaks like that. But in football statistics, uh, I forgot what PTA stands for. Anyway, it was fun to watch Super Bowl. But, you know, people speak in jargon all the time. Don't be intimidated by jargon. Just try to learn what they're talking about when they say in baseball, RBI or baseball's got a lot of statistics with just abbreviations in them. So let me tell you what a discrete random variable is. 
and I don't always do this, but I'm gonna do this simply by sharing a paper with you that I've already written. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm gonna copy this paper into our handout. And now you see the paper on the camera in the recording. And I'm also experimenting here because the point is it would take me 15 minutes to write this out for you, but I've written it out ahead of time. So we're in chapter four, exactly what is a discrete random variable? I'm also sensitive to people shouldn't just read slides to you, right? So if you're watching this video now or later, you can review this and read it at your own speed, even if I talk it now at my speed. So remember these things. When someone talks about discrete data, they're talking about data that you can count. How many buffaloes in the Yellowstone? How many home runs did Miguel Cabrera hit last season? How many strikeouts did Nolan Ryan have in his career? Things you can count. A random variable is something that describes the outcome of a statistical experiment or just an experiment in general in words. And the idea that it's describing the outcome of an experiment in words is really important. So random variable can mean anything that you're observing. I'll give you an example in a second. In the math class, in this math class, in statistics classes, it's very common when people want to describe an experiment with a random variable that they use a capital letter like X's and Y's for random variable, an experiment. And they use lowercase letters for the values of the random variable. I'll give you an example in a second. So this is the key sentence. I really like how the author presents this. I keep numbering my pages. So think like this. If capital X is a random variable, then capital X is something that is written in words. And if little x is the value of a random variable, then little x is given as a number. Let me tell you an example right away. So let's say I will do an experiment where I will toss a coin three times. So there, I just described an experiment to you in words. So this X right here, that is a random variable. That's what mathematicians call a random variable. Math teachers, mathematicians. It describes the outcome of an experiment in words. Let X be the number of heads you get when you toss a fair coin three times. That's the experiment. Now, when I ask you, well, what kind of things could happen? You realize I could get three tails or I could get tails, tails, heads, or I could get tails, heads, tails, 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 heads. You realize that I could, if you wrote all the possibilities down, have eight things that could happen. That's called the sample space. But the little X right here, Remember the experiment was how many heads I could get. What are the outcomes of that experiment? I could get zero heads like tails, tails, tails. I could get one head like tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, or heads, tails, tails. I could get two heads like tails, heads, 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 tails, heads, or heads, heads, tails. Or I could get three heads Heads, heads, heads. So do you see that this is the value of the random variable? It's a number. 
The random variable itself is an experiment described in words. I really like the way she says that. So pay attention to that. This X is called discrete random variable. Variable means it's something that's changing. It's the result of an experiment. Random means you do not control it. This is strictly a matter of chance. And discrete means there's only a finite number of things that could happen. So that's part of my goal today is to make you not be nervous about fancy words or fancy jargon. Okay, let's describe another discrete random variable. Let's say that I was rolling two dice. Here's a white dice and a red dice, and it's gonna be reflected in the things I'm gonna share on my whiteboard in a second. So we're gonna do an experiment now. There, I rolled the red die and white die, and I got two and two, so that's summed up to four. Roll again. Ah, box cars. Six and six, this adds up to 12. Six and three, this adds up to nine. Five and three, this adds up to eight. So you get an idea of what could happen if you rolled two dice, red dice, white dice. It could be the same color. I just made them different colors so that you know you could focus on one or the other. Okay, so what if I said our random variable, let's do an experiment. When I say let's do an experiment, it's very much like me saying, let's create a discrete random variable. Let's create a discrete random variable. And I will say my discrete random variable X is the sum of two fair six sided die. when rolled. That's an experiment that I described in words. And because you've rolled dice before, you know, dice is plural, die is singular. Fair means, you know, they're balanced that you don't get ones more than you get sixes. Six-sided, you've seen a lot of six-sided dice. They look like little cubes. And two of them means I'm rolling two of them together. So do you see, even if this is a simple experiment, you see what the experiment is, you understand the experiment. And if I gave you a pair of dice and said, go, you could perform this experiment. So this qualifies as a discrete random variable. I do wanna say this about notation. Sometimes when you write capital X's and little X's, it's hard to tell the difference. Is that a capital X or a little X I just wrote? If that is a problem for you, and if it's a problem in the way I write, you can write capital X like this, almost like a Roman numeral X. On a printed page in your book, it's kind of clear what's a capital X and what's a little X mostly. But if it's a problem for you here, I'll write capital X like that. Or you could write little x with a curl in it and capital X without a curl in it. So everybody has different ways of writing. You have to get used to the different ways of writing. Okay, now let's think about the values. What are the values? 
of this discrete random variable x. And this is where I'm going to do the experiment where we go over to the whiteboard. So I means I got to physically pin the whiteboard over there. Got it. Not because this is extremely clever what I wrote here, but I just wanted to have that pre-written so that you didn't have to copy it or write it down or, or that I didn't have to write down the paper. So here I'm thinking, here's an experiment, sum of two dice. So I abbreviated my experiment kind of. Here's a red die, here's a white die. I use blue color for that. The red die could show up one through six. The white die could show up one through six. And you've already thought about what could happen because you've rolled dice before. When you add them up, if you roll a three on the red and a four on the white, you get a seven. And so what I wrote in this table is all the things that could happen. And then you also know this because you've rolled dice before, playing Monopoly or something like that, or Risk. I like to play Risk. You see that some things are clearly more likely than another. Lots of rules and games have to do with rolling double sixes. Either you get benefits when you roll double sixes or you get penalties when you roll double sixes. If you roll a six and a six, it adds up to 12, you know that. But do you see how rare 12 is? That's why a lot of games give you benefits or penalties for rolling 12. You also know that you very hard to roll a two because one plus one is two and that's the only way you can roll a two. So this chart tells you, <coughs> excuse me, what is most likely and what is least likely you see that the most likely number to roll is a seven because there are one, two, three, four, five, six ways to roll that. And so in a game like craps, if you've ever played games of chance, seven, a sum of seven has an important purpose in the rules. So I'm gonna write this like this. The probability of getting the seven you can understand that notation. There are six ways I could roll a seven. I see from this entire table that there are 36 things that could happen. So you know that the probability of rolling a seven is one out of six. You could say six out of 36, and I wouldn't mind that either. You could also express this as a decimal, and I wouldn't mind that either. Now, in my mind, I have to think what the decimal that is. I round it off. One, six, six, seven. And remember, we use this rule right now that let's use four digits for probabilities unless someone tells us otherwise. Now you also know the probability of rolling an 11. Let's just count that. That's going to be relatively rare. There's only two ways you can roll an 11. And that's out of 36 different things that could happen. So that's one out of 18. And I might pull up my calculator for that. So excuse me when I go grab my calculator. One divided by 18 is zero point zero five five six. So this communicates one out of six, one out of 18, 16.67%, 5.56%. That communicates that this is more rare than that. Now here's another thing we're gonna do in a second, but I like it because you're starting to do it on your papers. You could easily make a really nice table that lists all the probabilities. Rolling a two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And I just calculated two probabilities, right? So uh, probability of getting a seven, zero point 
one, six, six, seven. The probability of getting an 11, 0 0.0556. By the way, part of the experiment I'm doing in this setup is I do see the chat window while I'm standing here at the board. So if you want to ask a question, you just go right ahead. Or as usual, you can just spit out the question. I think sometimes I have the problem that I have my speaker volume down, but I think my speaker volume is normal right now. Okay, so here's how we could fill in these numbers. But I'm writing kind of small, it's kind of hard to see. I agree with that. And I am not going to fill in this table in front of you here because it would take us five, 10 minutes. But I like the fact that you guys are starting to use tables like this because that means you're following the instructions in the book. Let's go for a real power move. Instead of me writing this in a table, I could write this in an Excel spreadsheet. I can have an Excel spreadsheet fill in all these columns. And not only is typing faster than writing sometimes, but I can have the spreadsheet do the calculations. Okay, now I'm about to do that and then we'll pull up a spreadsheet. I'll go sit down at my desk again. But here's where we are. You understand the experiment. You know all the things that could happen you know how likely each one of these things that could happen. You could fill in every single value in this table. And then you could discover what the mean is. You could discover, in a sense, what the standard deviation is. We're going to get to that later. But in a sense, because you've already rolled a lot of dice, you know in this problem what the mean is. You have equal chances throughout this table above and below seven. The most likely outcome, the thing that happens most often in this game of rolling two dice is that you roll a seven. Doesn't mean you only roll sevens. Doesn't mean you never roll twelves or elevens. It just means this is what you expect over a long period of time that you'd have seven most often and that the average value of all your rolls would be seven. You see that two plus 12 is 14, right? So those two equally unlikely things average to seven. Two ways to get a three, two ways to get an 11. Those both add up to 14 divided by two is seven. So seven is probably gonna be the, like the favorite number in this game. Okay, let me set it down for a second. Now let me go back to this paper and say this last word right here, because we're talking about section 4.1 right now. What is a probability distribution function? Oh, see, now that means I gotta switch back to the paper. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm back on my paper. What is a probability distribution function for a discrete random variable? A discrete probability function has two characteristics. Each of the probabilities is between zero and one, and the sum of the probabilities is one. So the probability distribution function is the thing that tells you the probability of each value. On my whiteboard, it's that first column I'm filling in in blue. In fact, I'm going to go fill that in right now in this column. So back to the whiteboard. But I also don't want you to worry. I'm not going to fill in the rest of this on the whiteboard. I just want to give you this demo. So let's fill in the probability of each one of these. I've already got two. I've got a few more to go. So what's the probability of getting two? One out of 36. I could write one out of 36, but I could also just ask the calculator. Oh, 
What's probability getting a three, two out of 36? That's 0.0556. Oh, notice that's the same as the probability of the 11. So that's even better. I don't have to fill in this whole table because the three probability matches the 11 probability. That means I only have to do like half of this and fill in the others. 12 probability, one out of 36, it's gonna match the two probability. So that's another reason why I'm not afraid to do this table by hand. So let's fill in the rest of them here. What's probability of four? Four, give me three ways to do that out of 36. So three divided by 36 is 0 0.0833. And that would also match 10. There are three ways to get a 10. Good, let's do five. There are four ways to get a five. Four divided by 36 is 1 ninth which is a decimal like that. And nine, there are four ways to get a nine. Like that. Just one more to go. And we do six divided by 36. I'm sorry, six is five ways to get a six. I do five divided by 36. 0 0.1389. That must also go for eight. 13.89% of the time to get an eight. Notice how seven is the biggest number here, even though it's not such a big number. And if I added up all these numbers, that's what I mean by probability distribution function. This column is the probability distribution function. And now we'll go back to my paper to see what I wrote. But what did I say a probability distribution function was? It has the characteristics that every number is between zero and one. And if you add up all these numbers, you automatically get one. Now, I'm not going to add these up physically in front of you. I'll have a computer do it in a second. So, but I'm telling the truth that these add up to one. You could physically add all these numbers and get to one. Remember, sometimes there's a rounding problem. Like we may have rounded here. We rounded all these numbers just about. So there might be a little bit left over, like an extra digit here or less digit there. But the idea is this adds up to one. OK. Go back to paper. Zoom, zoom, zoom. That is what I said right here. The probability distribution function has two characteristics. That means I'm describing it to you. Each probability is between zero and one, and the sum of the probabilities is exactly one. Now I'm gonna go over to another sheet of paper. And then we're going to do a fun experiment in Excel. So what do we want to do with this experiment? Well, you know the questions that are on your mind right now. Oh, what happens most often? What's the average number I get when I keep rolling dice many, many times? You already know the answers to this because you've rolled dice many times but I wanna show you how to work it out in math language. So we're talking now about the expected value, but in statistics, we know this is the mean. When I say to you, if you keep rolling this over and over again, and you added up all the numbers and you divided by the number of rolls, what would you expect the average to be? Sure, I'm gonna roll some sixes. Sure, I'm gonna roll some fives. But you have this intuitive feeling that in this game, the average over long-term is gonna be seven. 
the most frequent number is also seven. Uh, what did we call the most frequent number, the mode? So mean and mode are the same in this case. That's gonna be interesting in the picture. So when I say expected value of a long-term, I mean, long-term average, some of my paper got clipped off there. Sorry, long-term average or mean. It's the average that you would expect over a long period of time. Here's another fancy statement right here that's gonna be important to you. It's called, people throw this around as if it means something, it's important, it is important. The law of large numbers. But it sounds more important than it is. It, it, it's kind of like common sense. The law of large numbers just says that if you keep repeating that experiment over and over and over again, then what you see happen is going to match the theoretical probability of what happens. It says that the difference between the theoretical probability and the relative frequency of the event approaches zero. So I'm supposed to row seven one sixth of the time. If I roll six dice, there's a three, there's a four, there's a six, there's a six, there's a three, there's a nine. I just rolled the dice six times and I got no sevens. That's kind of funny, right? But that does not change your belief that if I rolled the dice 600 times, I might get a hundred sevens. That's what you'd bet money on or something close to a hundred sevens. That's what you'd really bet money on. Now here's the problem. I can roll the dice six times in front of you. I cannot roll the dice 600 times in front of you. But now we're gonna do the spreadsheet. That's where the computer gets cool because I can have the computer roll a dice 600 times in front of you. And let's check it out. So let me see what I'm gonna do right here. I am going to share my screen with you. I think I'm gonna open up an Excel spreadsheet. Zoom, 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 I'm looking. Oh, I don't have one prepared. I'm just gonna open one up and fill it up with you so you can see it. And then we'll post it on our website so you can play with it. So here's an Excel spreadsheet. I wanna make sure you see it. So I'm gonna share it with you. I'm gonna go and share it with you. Got it. Now we all see it. Now I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller. Good. Now, I'm going to start to fill it in like I filled in the whiteboard. So I know I might be doing some fancy Excel things for a second, but don't worry about that. You can take this home with you and experiment yourself. So let me first of all see if I can make it kind of larger so you can look at it easier. Maybe that's a little bit easier. Let me type what I typed on the board. I'm not gonna try to decorate. I'm just gonna try to type. There's an X. That's a lowercase X. There's a P of X. There's a X times P of X. I'm reproducing what I wrote on the board. I don't know how to type fancy Greek letters. So I'm gonna do X minus mu, because that's that Greek letter that I wrote on the board. And then I'm gonna do X minus mu squared. Okay, so I'm gonna fill in a little table right here. I'm gonna have the computer do the work for me. What were my X's? You know, if you like, I can center this. Makes it slightly easier to read, right? Uh, can I blow this up in other ways to make it easier for you to read? Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll experiment. So what were my possible X's? Two, three, sorry, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Now here's where I start to use Excel power. I got the probabilities for each of these, right? The probabilities were two divided by or one divided by thirty-six, and the calculator. Excel already fills this in automatically. I'm going to shorten that to four digits. So it looks a little bit like our board, right? Then I can do three divided by 36. Then I can do four divided by 36. You know, I can also cheat and say, click on the four and divide by 36. And the benefit of that in Excel is now I can pull down that number and fill in the whole table. Well, okay, I got to be careful what I'm doing. Yeah, I guess I'm screwing up there. I'm not talking about 2 divided by 36. I'm talking about the number of times I could get a 2. There's only 2, so I better retrace my steps. There's only two ways to get a 3. Now I'm filling the table. Three ways to get a four, four ways to get a five, five ways to get a six, I could automate this, maybe we'll automate it later, six ways to get a six, a seven, and then I could copy these and put them in the other locations. Okay, good. So what am I doing right here? I'm reproducing what I got on the board. What's the benefit of the doing that? I could add up all these numbers right away. See on the bottom of my spreadsheet down here, it says sum is 1.00. I could tell the Excel spreadsheet to sum, and then I could just drag over these cells, sum all these cells. Excel says from B2 to B12, got it. It's exactly one. Okay, I'll bold face that, and bold face that, and bold face that. Now let's multiply X times each one of these. That's how I'm gonna get the mean. Let me go back to my paper. What is going to be the long-term average? The long-term average, the expected value, the mean, is the Greek letter mu. And it's pretty easy to calculate. You just multiply each x times its probability. And then you add up all those products. Now, this is a fancy math language. says add up. For every little x in capital X, the product of little x and p of x. So in English, you say it like this. Multiply each value of the random variable by its probability and add up these products. Let's go back to our spreadsheet and do it. And we do that by saying equals in the spreadsheet, equals, and then just click on this cell. Hit the multiplication symbol, the asterisk, and click on that cell. Now I'm going to multiply those two cells. And I get 0, 0, 0.0556. 0 0.0556. But the cool thing is, instead of repeating that command, I'll just drag it down. And I'm going to multiply all of them. Do you see that? Let's look at this 1667. Click on the bar. What was that done? That was done by multiplying cell A7 times cell B7. What about this cell right here? Click on the formula bar. It's multiplying four times 0 0.0833. And that gave me the 3333. Now, what is mu? Mu is adding all these up. And do you see if I add all these up? Do you see if I just highlight it at the bottom? It says, here's your sum, it's seven. 
but do you want to see the sum? I'll say equals sum. And now I got, excuse me, I didn't like my formula. <laughs> equals sum. If it throws an error at you, don't be afraid of it. Just find out why. Close the question or close the parentheses. Adds up to seven exactly. This is my mu. Mu equals seven. I'm going to bold face that too. Maybe I should make it red. Problem with doing that is we get a little bit too crazy by decorating things sometimes. So don't go crazy decorating things. So now you know that when you roll the dice many, many times, you should expect the average to be seven. Let's go back to the paper. Let's remember what standard deviation was. Here's the instructions for standard deviation. Standard deviation says, you multiply the square of the deviation of each value of the random variable by the probability of that value and then you add the products and take the square root. Now this is the same standard deviation we've talked about before, but expressing in terms of probability makes the formula look a little bit different. So let's say in English, what I just wrote here in math, you take the deviation from the average, that's the X minus seven or x minus mu, you square it. <coughs> then you multiply by the probability of that value. Then you add them all up for every x in your experiment. And then you take the square root. This is called the standard deviation. Remember x minus mu is called the deviation, but adding those up gave me a zero. I want to know how far away from the average should I normally expect I'm gonna be. I know I'm gonna roll some 11s. I know I'm gonna roll some twos. But most of the time I should be pretty close to seven. Let's do this in the spreadsheet. So what do I have to do right here? I could just say each one of these X's, I'm gonna subtract seven. I could do that by myself or I could do that with a formula. Let's do it with a formula. Two minus seven. And that's negative five. Notice when I pull this down to the next cell, I get an error. Why do I get an error? Let's look at the problem. The first cell, is doing the two minus seven. But look at this error and look at what cells I'm using. Three minus mu? No, I don't want three minus mu. I want three minus seven. I want the three to go down. I don't want the seven to go down. And the way you do this in Excel is by putting a dollar sign in front of that row number 13. That'll keep that row number fixed. Now, when I pull down, I get three minus seven is four, negative. See, two and seven makes negative five. Three minus seven makes negative four. This is good. Now I'm ready to do all the calculations exactly. Puff. This is what I can do with a calculator Excel that I don't want to do all the time with my pencil and paper. Now let's square each one of these numbers. You know that negative five squared is 25, but I don't wanna do it. I want the computer to do it. So I'll take that cell and square it. And I get my 25. Now I'll just pull this down. And what does Excel do? My goodness, it just squares every number for me. Now, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to multiply those squares by P of X, which is over here in this column, right? So I want to multiply the P of X column 
times the deviation squared column. I guess I'm going to need a new column here. Let's write it. X minus mu. I'm writing the title of this table right here. I'm not writing the formula. I'm just writing the title of the table so I can keep track of it later. It kind of takes up some space, so I'll make that column wider. And now you know what I'm going to do with my formula. I'm going to tell the calculator, I'm going to tell Excel to multiply this number 25 times asterisk this number 0278. Get some crazy number there, right? So let's first of all make it just four digits so we don't get distracted by the number of digits. But you see I'm rounding off. And then let's drag it all the way down. There's the magic. Automatically, all these numbers are filled in. You could check by hand that it's actually correct. Maybe you should, but these are the correct x minus mu squared times p of x. Now let's add these together. I want to add this whole column together. So I say equals sum and hit return or hit the parentheses to hit return. 5.833. Now remember that is not standard deviation. I want the square root of that number. This number, before I take the square root, happens to be called the variance. And we might talk about that later. It's not the most important thing right now. But just know that the variance is what happens when you add the deviation squared times the probability of each event. What I want is called sigma. That is a standard deviation. And that is equal to the square root of the variance. And I can write that in a formula. In Excel, just type square root of number. And Excel does the square root for you. So now I know. I'm going to try to decorate this again. I shouldn't over decorate things. There's my average. And here is my standard deviation. Have you ever wondered about that? When you roll dice, most of the time, it appears you should be within 2.4 units of 7. Subtract 2. It's 5 to 9. Subtract 2, add 2 is 5 to 9. So 2.4. So that means, and we're going to find this out later. Now you say, you still roll 12s. And I say, well, I'll tell you what. I bet if you did this about two thirds of the time, you'd roll between five and nine, including. So let's do six more experiments. This is the part that's fun. You can do this yourself. So if I roll this dice six times, there's a seven, my first seven of the day. There's a five. There's a four. Loser, not between five and nine. So that's two winners and one loser. There's an eight. Sorry, there's an eight. You have to trust me. <laughs> that's between five and nine. So now I've rolled three things between five and nine and one thing not. There's a six. That is between five and nine. There's a seven that is between five and nine. I just rolled the dice in front of you six times and five out of the six times, I was between five and nine. I was close to seven. That's not a proof of anything, but it's an understanding in a way of what this number called sigma, standard deviation means. Let me write that in there, standard deviation. And now we're going to have a lot more fun. This is called mean or expected value. Okay. So 
just to color code that. This is the trouble with color coding when you got to color code everything. And make that bold and you make that bold. Okay, oops, sorry. So that's what standard deviation mean, mean to you. Isn't that kind of funny that those numbers, they just seem like crazy numbers from out of the sky, but they actually mean that when you roll the dice, two thirds of the time, you're gonna be between five and nine. Now let's roll the dice, but I don't wanna roll it six times. I wanna roll it 600 times. So I'm going to move this spreadsheet over a little bit. I'm gonna slide down here a little bit, but when you download the spreadsheet, you can do it yourself. I wanna create a little experiment here where I roll dice. So I'm going to create a table that's just gonna be a certain size. So to cram the numbers in, I'm gonna make the columns a little bit smaller. Uh, it doesn't particularly mean what size I'm gonna make them. So let me show you how to make a dice roll in Excel. You use the command called random. When you use that command in Excel in general, you have to say equals random and put parentheses after it. It's a little bit like your calculator. It gives you a random number between zero and one. Now, if you wanna make this into a dice, you want to make a random number between zero and six, you could multiply by six. And then every time you do that, it gives you a random number between zero and six. Here's one roll. Every time I change a box, I'll roll the dice again. Third roll, fourth roll. Now you don't like this because the dice doesn't show up five, seven, five, three, nine, blah, blah, blah. So what I need to do is get rid of the decimals. So I'm gonna do that by using another Excel command called ceiling. Ceiling is just a way of saying, give me the number, give me the whole number above that last number. Oops. Sorry, too many parentheses, too few arguments. Oh, I have to say ceiling to the nearest one unit. Okay, there I rolled a dice and got a six. There I rolled a dice and got a two. There I rolled a dice and got a three. Every time I change anything on the spreadsheet, do you see I'm rolling the dice, I got a six. Now let's copy that dice I just created and put it underneath. Excuse me, I'm gonna copy the dice. I can just drag it down. Now I just rolled snake eyes. Now I rolled a one and three. Now I rolled a two and one. Now I rolled a one and six. Now I rolled a three and one. I'm rolling too many ones. I don't like that at all. Am I doing this legally? Yeah, I got the same command there as I got there. But now I'm rolling a pair of dice and let's add them up right here. Take the sum of the two dice above me. There's a nine. Again, there's a two. Again, there's an 11. Again, there's a six. So now I've created two dice being added up together, right? Now you're not impressed yet because I said I was gonna do it 600 times. Well, here's how I'm gonna do it 600 times. Let's take these two commands and put them together in one box. So let me put two dice in one box by copying that ceiling of a random number between one and six. And 
And now you see in my command here, I have two dice being added together. And now every time, oops, sorry, back out. Every time I change the spreadsheet, I will roll two dice in that box. Fours, nines, good. Now I can copy that box. Now I just rolled two dice six times. Now I just rolled two dice six more times. Now I just rolled two dice six more times. Now let's get really weird. Let's go down six rows. Now I just rolled two dice 36 times. Let's make this column a different size so I can manage it a little bit better. Every time I change my thing, I just rolled two dice 36 times. Now let's add this up into a column. Let's insert two columns here. And now I know I'm doing a lot of Excel heavy stuff right here. And we could do this equally as well on the calculator and we will, if not today, next time. But I'm just showing you that I don't want to do an experiment 600 times. I want the machine to do it for me. So let's write two, three, four. Let's go all the way down to 12. And then let's put in this box, ask the computer how many times it saw a two here. And I do that by using formula count if, and count if that box equals two. Uh, did I not put it in quotation marks? That's why you have to download my worksheet. So look at the box that I just rolled. How many twos do you see in that box? Once here, and the computer says there's two twos. Do you see another two? Oh, there it is right there. But watch, and I changed this sheet. Now I only rolled one two, where is it? It's right there. Let's do it again. Now I rolled one, two. Let's do it again. Now I rolled zero twos. There's no twos in here. But I want to have the calculator add everything. So now let's have it count how many threes I rolled. Take down that formula and change the two in there to a three. Look at that. In that roll of 36 dice, I rolled no twos and no threes. That's incredible. Yeah, but twos and threes are rare. Let's try it again. There I rolled one, two, and no threes. Where's the two? Oh my gosh, I can't find it. Do you see a two? I don't see the two. Did I goof up? I'm looking for a two in here and I don't see the two. That's funny. Let's try it again. I have one, two, and two threes. Here's my one, two. Here's my two threes. Do I see two threes right there? Ah, so I see what's happening. The problem is, look in the formula. I changed that first cell to a three. Now it's counting threes. And I changed this cell to a two. I switched the two cells. So I got to do a different way of counting. What I'm going to do in this formula is change this to equals quotation marks and put an and, and then put that cell right there. And it wants to correct my writing. So I say no. Let me correct my writing for you. Take out that thing. There. Now let's show you what that does. Now I will read these 36 boxes and look for a two. 
And that just happened one time. Where did it happen? It happened right there. But the beauty of this is now that I've said, read the box on the left and look for a two, a three, a four, a five, six, seven. I can pull this down and have it look for those numbers. You see, that's ridiculous. I see a 10, but it saw no 10s. Why am I doing that wrong? Ah, because I slid the box down. So what I have to do is fix this box between M and R, between rows two and seven. So I need to put dollar signs in front of the M, the two, the R, and the seven. Now that blue box is fixed, nailed down. And now I can count how many tens did I get? I must have got four tens. They're right there. How many eights did I get? I must have got seven eights. Where are they? There, 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 and there. Do you see I counted seven eights? Okay, now I got a machine that's gonna, with 36 rolls, do the probability of each number I get. So let's take this number divided by 36, and let's freeze that cell at K1, and then let's pull down. There's my probability when I rolled 36 times. Now I'm gonna add some decoration to it. Insert a line. This is my experimental probability. I got no twos that time, but I'd like to add the theoretical probability. The theoretical probability came from this column right here. So I'm going to copy those numbers and place them right here. And then I can compare them every time I roll the dice. How close are they? Sometimes they're close. Sometimes they're exact. Sometimes they're not. But if I roll the dice many, many times, I would see them being almost always the same. Now I'm going to do this. Let us add a graph to see this happening. So I'm going to take the numbers 2 through 12. I'm going to call that sum. I'm going to move this 36 out of my way and say, here's the 36 rolls. I'm going to take the theory and experiment and put them on the top there. And I'm going to make a graph with the sum and the theory and the experiment. So here's my sum column and my theory column. And in Excel, I'm going to tell Excel to insert a histogram, something like a histogram here. That doesn't look very good. So I can clean this up. It's actually plotting two different things. Here's the numbers two through 12 in blue. Let's delete those. Ah, there's the numbers two through 12. Let's see if I can use those as a, let me get rid of that. I'm going to add data labels. And the data labels are right there. No, nope, I don't want to add data labels, sorry. Let's undo that. What I want to do is format the data series and add Nope, excuse me, get rid of there. Format the data series or select data. I don't want to do that. I always have to practice doing things in Excel. There we go, the horizontal labels. Okay, so I want to make my horizontal labels two through 12. 
Okay, that's better. Now let's clean this up. Let's make these numbers more readable by making them larger. Let's make these numbers more readable by making them larger. Let's make these numbers more readable by making them larger. Good. And then let's make this kind of like histogram-like by saying that the gap width is zero and the edges are going to have a border that's a solid line. All these, sorry. Select all those columns, make the border a solid line. Good. Now you see this orange histogram. Now let's repeat it for the experiment. Let's take the sum and the experiment. And let's repeat inserting a column, but we're going to do it faster now that we know how to do it correctly. I'm going to get rid of these blue things. We're going to change these. Letter sizes so I can read them. I'm going to decorate this exactly as I decorated the other one. And I'm going to make these larger. And we're running out of time, but let me finish this up here. I'm going to make the gap width zero. And I'm going to make these things, sorry, have borders to them, solid lines. Good, there's my experiment. Now, do you see that every time I do this, the experiment graph changes because I always get a different result. That's not very impressive because that does not look like the one on the left. What I have to do is fix these values here in this column. I'm going to fix those values like they're fixed in the theory graph at 20 and marking every 0 0.5. Okay, that's good. Now that looks like that. And let's get the decimals in there. Labels, numbers, uh, tick marks. What do I want to display units, logarithmic scales? Okay, I want to have these numbers here have the same number of decimal places as they do over here. I'll figure out how to do that later. So now every time I change, I get a new histogram. And you're still saying, no, this is crazy. They never match. Why do they never match? And I'm saying they never match because I'm only rolling 36 die. Let's pump that up to many, many, many die. So what I'm going to do here is take these columns and make a lot of columns of size five. And then I'm going to take this dice roll and scratch it all the way out to over here. And then I'm going to roll the dice a lot of times, take that row and let's roll it all the way down the page for quite a while. Sorry. I'm going to just pull it all the way down the page. And let's see what I got here. I got lots and lots of die. Look at that. I'm rolling the die many, many times. How many times? I'll ask Matt Excel to count how many times I rolled the dice there. From that cell, sorry, nope. I don't want this helper thing here. I'm going to move this down to there and over to there. Nope, not working. So count A from N3 to 
where? All the way down at the bottom of this, which is BO45. I'm doing this kind of randomly, that's true. But let's write BO45. I just rolled the dice there. How many times? 2,322 times. And now, if I ask it to count the number of twos it sees in that space from N3, to B-O, what? B-O 45? Let's see how many ends it sees, how many twos it sees. It's looking at this whole giant box and says, you rolled a sum of two 48 times. Now let's pull it down all the way across. Look at that. You rolled two 76 times. You rolled 348 times. What did you get here? An experimental probability that was darn close to the theoretical probability. Now, is it exactly equal to? No. But how close is it? The pictures tell me how close it is. Look at these two graphs. These two graphs are showing you that I essentially got the same result each time. And each time I do this again, you notice the one on the right, the graph on the right slightly changes. I'm just keep hitting the delete key to re-roll 2,322 dice. The graph slightly changes because I'll always have a slight difference but each one of those graphs looks very much like the theoretical probability. I could make many, many more dice. Do you know what? I think when I get off the line here, because I got to go because I've kept you too long, I think I'll pump this up to 6,000 dice. And then I'll let you compare how the theory matches the experiment. OK, you could also do something similar to this on the calculator except it's harder to do things by the thousands and tens of thousands on your calculator. It's easier to do that in Excel. And that's why I wanted to show you the sheet. I'm going to get offline here. I'm going to uh, finish the recording, uploading, and then you can watch this again if you like. I'm going to stop sharing and upload these papers. Excuse me, I gotta get my phone back in the game so that you can practice this yourself. But now you've been introduced to what a discrete random variable is. We'll do more examples of it next time. And next time I think I will do this also on the calculator. So you can see how to generate the same graphs and tables on your calculator. There's a little bit of an advantage there. It's not as fancy as Excel. You don't have to know fancy Excel commands. You can usually work through the menus of the calculator to get the calculator commands. You pay a price. In Excel, you can do things by the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. Of course, in your calculator, it doesn't got enough juice to do 100,000 dice rolls. OK, you guys have a good day. And send me a question if you have a question. Finish up some homework. Finish up that second batch of Newton Alta assignments. And that'll also get you ready for your exam. We'll talk more about the exam next time. I apologize. I've got to go directly to another meeting, but I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.